ജീവൻ സാറേ നമസ്കാരം കേൾക്കാവോ സാറിന്റെ വീഡിയോ മ്യൂട്ട് ആണ് ഓഡിയോ മ്യൂട്ട് ആണ് ഇപ്പോഴോ ഇപ്പൊ ഓക്കെ ഇപ്പൊ ഓക്കെ സമയം ആവുന്നേ ഉള്ളൂ ആ കുഴപ്പമില്ല ഞാനൊന്ന് കയറി നോക്കിയാ നമ്മൾ അന്നേരം ഓടി വന്നാലേ അതെ അതെ നന്നായി ആദ്യ ഗുഡ് മോർണിംഗ് ഗുഡ് മോർണിംഗ് സർ ബാക്കിൽ വരാൻ വേണ്ടി നമുക്ക് വെയിറ്റ് ചെയ്യാം കുറച്ചുകൂടെ സമയം കൃത്യം നമുക്ക് പത്ത് മണിക്ക് സ്റ്റാർട്ട് ചെയ്താൽ മതിയല്ലോ ഇന്നത്തെ ഒരു ന്യൂസ് പേപ്പർ കട്ടിങ് തന്നെയല്ലേ നമ്മൾ നീക്കണ്ടേ ഇൻട്രോഡക്ഷൻ ആ കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ടും
ഞാനിപ്പോ just making sure that you are here i'm ready i'm ready okay okay uh i think only three more can be added uh i think i shall restrict uh, with 97 because uh, our three resource persons have to be added today the remaining three resource persons hmm. so uh, shall we start adya shall we start adya yes sir okay. good morning everyone uh, today is the second day of the national e conference in the morning session uh, there will be two talks first is on vein seabolt by dr k jeevan kumar and the second is on betty freedon by dr n geeta in the afternoon session two there will be two talks one by mr anand k on paulo freire and by dr jason p jacob on sugar ray robinson before i invite dr k jeevan kumar for the first talk i ask father anu to so to say a few words on dr k jeevan kumar A warm good morning to one and all present here, respected resource persons, teachers, and all the participants. Today, that is the second day of the three days of National E Conference, we are blessed to begin the sessions of the day with a talk on Wayne C. Booth, an American writer, by the eminent speaker, Dr. K. Jeevan Kumar. He is the Associate Professor and the Chair of the English Department at the Henry Baker College, Melukov. His teaching career began as a lecturer in 1993 and became an Associate Professor in 2006. Professor Dr. Jeevan Kumar's research interest includes literary theory, Latin American literature, postmodernism, and translation studies. He is the author of seven books, including two translations and one he co-edited. In addition, he authored more than 32 research papers, scholarly articles, and reviews. Above all, he is an eminent speaker who has delivered several talks on different occasions to different audiences. So let's welcome Professor Dr. Jeevan Kumar. to enlighten us with the talk on wine sea both welcome sir let's make the best out of this lecture thank you thank you for your kind words uh, dear father uh, i think we will directly move on to the person we commemorate today uh, wine sea booth uh, just sharing i think i'm uh, you can see my can you see yes. the yes yes okay. 
So when C. Booth was born at uh, American Fork, Utah in 1921 and is brought up as a Mormon by his parents. And this is this may be one of the reasons for his um, enduring concern with morals and values. And we will just um, have a look at his major works before we uh, come to the um, major concepts and ideas uh, that enlighten the critical world. So one of his most famous works is um, The Rhetoric of Fiction, which is very familiar to most of the academics. Um, and we will be looking at this uh, work in a detailed manner soon. And another work, uh, Modern Drama and uh, Modern Dogma and the Rhetoric of Ascent. Uh, this is an exploration uh, in the theory of rhetoric. Here, both examines the process of accepting and refuting arguments, especially uh, arguments about values and morals. In 1974, he published another major work, uh, that is The Rhetoric of Irony. And here, Booth divides irony into two, stable and unstable ironies. Irony turns unstable if it leads to an interpretation uh, that can make it rather ambiguous, while stable irony implies the writer's intention, uh, it implies that the writer's intention is clearly understood. And uh, the next work I would like to mention is The Company We Keep, An Ethics of Fiction. Uh, this is uh, a, a work uh, which um, both develops uh, the concepts uh, he first introduced in the rhetoric of fiction. We'll be talking about this uh, work as well soon. Then, of course... Uh, he has written many works, but we'll be referring to two more here. Uh, that is critical understanding the powers and limits of pluralism. So in this work, Booth argues that there are multiple ways of approaching literary texts. But he asserts that he is not uh, taking a relativist view that they are all equally valid. He tries to establish uh, common standards against which critical interpretation can be evaluated. And the second work I have uh, mentioned here is uh, The Rhetoric of Rhetoric, The Quest of Effective Communication. It was published in 2004, the year before his death. This book gives a brief history of rhetoric. It examines why rhetoric uh, has diminished in importance as a branch of study and why it became popular in academic circles. So, we will also mention another uh, work which may be familiar to literary students, that is his famous introduction to uh, Mikhail Bakhtin's uh, Problems of Dostoevsky's Poetics. Uh, I, don't, um, I don't like to speak about it uh, because it may take us to Bakhtin and uh, take our focus away from Booth himself. And Booth was the president of uh, Modern Language Association in 1982, and he was uh, also associated with the Chicago Style Manual. He was also instrumental in establishing the journal, uh, the famous journal Critical Inquiry. Now, looking at his uh, academic uh, development as a graduate student, as a graduate student at the University of Ch Chicago, uh, Booth was trained by R.S. Crane one of the foremost figures of the Chicago School of Criticism. Critics like Crane looked upon the text as a system of communication in which plot, characterization, and the overall structure had a significant impact. The influence of Crane is evident in the extended meaning that Booth gives to the term rhetoric. We all know that rhetoric means the art of using language so as to persuade or influence others. Emphasizing the fact that a literary text is a form of communication, Booth argues that 
both the author and the reader have to take a responsible part in this process of communication. Booth's approach to the novel is determined by the conviction that, I quote, the novel comes into existence as something communicable. It is an essentially public form. And that is how he uh, calls the novel. In the rhetoric of fiction and the company we keep, fiction is viewed as an art of communication. An art of communication with the readers. The rhetoric of fiction examines how the author, the text, and the reader interact in the process of writing and, and reading the novel. According to both, the central task of the author is to transmit to the reader a clear sense of the fictional world and its moral problems. The chief tool for the writer and the critic of the novel is rhetoric. It is also the means by which a particular author's, uh, author's fictional world and its moral norms are communicated to the reader. Both begins by asking, uh, I quote, if rhetoric is compatible with art, and he concludes with the assertion that every move, move the writer makes is rhetorical that fiction is rhetoric. All the elements of the novel, like setting, dialogue, and symbolism, are part of its system of persuasion or rhetoric. There are two extremes in the fictional rhetoric. One, the use of a garrulous narrator who obstructs the reader's, uh, reader's access to the fictional world by distracting them. And the example uh, Booth gives is the narrator in Tom Jones. And at the other extreme, there is the elimination of such narratives so that the reader is left drifting, unable to make sense of the fictional world. And for this extreme, he gives a, a French example, Alain Robégrier's Jealousy. It's a 1957 novel, which is part of the French Nouveau Roman. Uh, and Booth does not approve of both these extremes. A, a truly effective novel will be uh, between these two extremes. And between these two extremes comes the novels that communicate successfully, for which uh, the inseparability of form and content, as well as form and morality, is essential. So here again, Booth uh, asserts morality, uh, an inseparability of uh, both form and content as well as form and morality. Both wants to subordinate technical innovation uh, to the obligation to make clear the moral position of the novel. So that is very significant for him. The moral position, what, what is to be communicated through a novel or the rhetoric of the novel is the moral position of the uh, novel. The most significant contribution to the theory and criticism of prose fiction is Booth's analysis of point of view and the functions of narrator in relation to the author, text, and the reader. According to Booth, identifying whether the story is narrated from the first or third person is not enough. What is important is to ascertain whether the narrator is dramatized in his own right and whether his beliefs and characteristics are shared by the author. So it is here that um, Booth makes a distinction between dramatized and undramatized narratives. Uh, I'll just uh, try to explain this uh, undramatized and, and dramatized narratives. In novels, uh, the events unfold through the consciousness of narrators. But in many cases, there is no sign of uh, actual storytelling. The narrator will be there, but the reader, uh, the readers would uh, may not um, take note of him. 
the narrators are given no personal characteristics and so the role, so the reader may have an impression of unmediated narration this kind of narration is termed by both as undramatized dramatized narrators on the other hand uh, whether they take part in the events that unfold or or uh, whether they are not characters in their own right and he also refers to another kind of narratives that is disguised narratives and they are and disguised narratives uh, are dramatized narratives who are not labeled by authors as narrator and one of the chief concepts of um, booth is the idea of the implied author if the novel is an act of communication then it must resemble a message a message must have a sender and at least one receiver and the meaning is evolved in the interaction among these three that is the sender the receiver and the message that is the meaning is not in the message but in the process of communication as we have already said both regards text as forms of communication between the author and the reader he explains this by distinguishing between the author and the implied author so we come to the next concept that is the implied author both defines the implied author as the author's second self i quote second self that is how he calls the implied author the novel creates an implicit picture of an author who stands behind the scenes this is how he Uh, defines the implied author i'll try to explain this the implied author is always different from the real man or woman who wrote the novel and he is different from the narrator as well in the company we keep both calls the real author the flesh and blood author he also presents the concept of the career author that is another concept so he He, he presents the implied author who is the author's second self we'll come to this again uh, and uh, he also refers to uh, the the flesh and blood author that is the man who writes the novel uh, for example uh, but there's a big difference between the or the the implied author and the flesh and blood author for example if you take the case of dickens he used to travel and um, great distances to make his uh, speeches and consider uh, dickens uh, getting out of a train uh, he says that his back aches and this person is not the novelist dickens or the author dickens we will come to this uh, more clearly uh, and along with this uh, implied author and the flesh and blood author Uh, both also presents the concept of uh, the career author and what is this uh, concept once we have read uh, to, uh, read uh, some two or more works of uh, two or more novels of uh, the same flesh and blood author we begin putting together uh, two or more implied authors from uh, these two novels we read we have uh, the pictures of uh, implied authors and we put together these pictures to form a composite career author who is not equivalent to the flesh and blood author so we form our sense of the implied author from what is said and done in the text and from the structure of the novel and its overall arrangement its flow uh, its structure all the elements of the novel the narrator is only one element in our conception of the implied author so that is how um, both uh, present the idea of the implied author he is different from the flesh and blood author um, he is not the career author and 
the implied author our conception of the implied author is also formed by um, our ideas about the narrator the implied author communicates with the reader and it is this implied author who communicates with the reader in an effective novel the implied author leads the reader in the difficult in, a, in the difficult journey through what um, both calls the moral maze of the story and our sense of the implied author comes from i quote the kind of tale he chooses to tell the implied author chooses consciously or unconsciously what we read we infer him as an ideal literary created version of the real man he is the sum of his own choices that is how both uh, speaks about the implied author and along with this uh, uh, ideas on the author both also uh, refers to uh, reliable and unreliable uh, narrators but before that uh, i would like to uh, say something more about the implied author because um, according to both the implied author and the narrator are two integral parts of his critical methodology the implied author and the narrator are there for the reader the author does not write only for himself the perspective that the rhetoric of fiction uses is focused on how authors construct texts they construct the text rhetorically for the reader the implied author is an integral part of the work he needs uh, the needs of the work compel the author and the reader to create an implied author the so the implied author is a, a creation of the flesh and blood author as well as the reader the actual feelings and values of the flesh and blood author cannot be known however the reader builds responses and attitudes and assimilates information about the implied author both supplies uh, three terms he presents three terms that name the core of the norms and choices uh, which he calls the implied author one is style by style he means the main source of insight into the author's norms the second is tone that is the implicit evaluation which the author manages to convey behind his explicit presentation and the third is technique which uh, can be used to cover all the signs of the author's artistry that is the the his method of presentation of the story to be to be in simple terms so these terms that is style tone and technique together delineate delineate a, the created version of the real man is the sum of his own choices as we said earlier the implied author removes the pointless and unvariable talk about the authentic truth to life author or the flesh and blood author we have uh, we only have to work as the evidence of the author's intention and so only the work can verify the author's choices the implied author has values and is engaged with life so we come to the narrative part regarding uh, narrators um, both presents uh, reliable and unreliable narrators a narrator is reliable when he speaks or acts according to the norms of the work that is the implied author's norms and a narrator is unreliable when he does not when he does not act according to the norms of the work or the norms of the implied author there is no distance between the implied author and the reliable narrators that is how he says so i think uh, both for both the unreliable narrator uh, 
is not uh, equivalent to the postmodern narratives. Uh, he gives us an example of uh, the unreliable narrator, the uh, Twain's Huckleberry Finn. That is his example. The narration also affects the reader's engagement with the text. The implied author and the narrator are not to be confused. We have already mentioned this. Although the narrator and the implied author can converge in some cases, that is uh, what Booth says. In other cases, the narrator will act as a foil to the implied author or the characters. And thus he becomes uh, the object of readers' praise or condemnation. For this reason, Booth discusses the importance of examining how an author uses narration in each text. For example, distance is one of the most important aspects of the rhetoric of narration. And regarding distance, um, Booth has uh, given uh, three or four sets of distances between narrative elements. The first is the narrator may be more or less distant from the implied author, the characters, and the norms of the reader. In the second case, uh, the implied author may be more or less distant from the reader, the characters, and the fallible or unreliable narratives. And uh, he also speaks about the types of distance. So, the types of distance, this refers to the aesthetic distance, uh, which can be, uh, see, I have given here three moral or uh, moral and intellectual types of distance, temporal or emotional distance, and aesthetic distance. But uh, this can be combined. This can come in a combined manner. We'll come to this later. Uh, so, Booth is also concerned with uh, reading ethically, writing ethically. That is how he uh, gives a subtitle, reading and writing ethically. The critical distance between the reader and the author and the narrator's reliability becomes part of a larger moral question for Booth. Both is interested in using ethics, emotions, and logic equally in order to make rational decisions. From a, from a postmodern perspective, reading a text is uh, impossible in, the, in, a, in a world where nothing is concrete or real. Because the science slips and slides in, uh, into endless play, not allowing any ethical discourse. But both regards um, uh, it in quite different in a quite different manner. Both theorizes that the reader will follow the expectations put in place by his or her moral habitus, which is the ethical and moral education of a lifetime. Moral habitus is the ethical and moral education of a lifetime within a certain community. The habitus is always part of the reading process. We will join an author's portrait of the narrator or character if we are in agreement with the morals in the text. That is how he uh, Booth uh, says in uh, Rhetoric of Fiction. In the afterward to uh, the Rhetoric of Fiction, uh, Booth says that the reader's moral decision-making process may have been uh, too narrow. We must make decisions about the text based on our value system. And so for Booth, um, impersonal narration disengages the narrator from leading the reader to the moral ground. And this can be ethically suspect when the, uh, that ground is a vicious marsh. That is how he's, he says. Impersonal and unreliable narration can reflect, I quote, a profoundly confused, basically self-deceived 
and even wrong-headed or vicious narrator. Ambiguity and confusion of the narrator generally leads to a confused and ambiguous reader. Both states that we must attempt to deal honestly with the problems presented by the selective rocks. That is how he calls the modern uh, narratives, sed selective rocks who narrate much of modern fiction. Now we will uh, look at the, uh, the type of readers. Booth has um, presented. But I think uh, before that, uh, we will look a bit more about the about uh, the, the, the implied author uh, before we go to this types of distance because I think I, I left one uh, point there. Uh, our sense of the implied author comes not just mainly from the explicit commentary but from the kind of tale he chooses to tell. That is what he says. This sense uh, also includes not only the extractable meanings but also the moral and emotional content of each bit of action and suffering of all the characters. The implied author chooses, consciously or unconsciously, what we read. We infer him as an ideal, literary, created version of the real man. That is how he, he speaks about the implied author. Now, uh, coming to the the four models of uh, uh, reading process that uh, Booth speaks of. Actually, I have given uh, five here because the fourth one is the uh, new critical model. That is the four models of S5. Only four are uh, the first. Uh, what I have given uh, in blue form uh, is the entity in this uh, relationship uh, which has supremacy. So the first, of course, um, the author a text and reader. So the reading process, uh, the text which is given in square brackets was not just a work of art um, because it is the text is just the it is the vehicle of the author's expression of his unique personality uh, his sensibility and the power of imagination the traditional view in which the reading process was seen then of course the second and third uh, reading models. Uh, there you can see that the author's prominence is uh, lost. Where, because the author is uh, in, a, in a kind of relation with the society and later in the, uh, in the third, the text and the reader, the relationship between the text and the reader, the reader and the society also becomes important. important. So, uh, in these two models, the second and third models, the author loses his preeminence um, in that because uh, in that his society and his interaction with the society is taking is taken into account. Not just their society, but uh, you can when you when you refer to society, we can say history in general has a formative impact on how and what he or she writes, and what is written in turn may affect the society. That is why in the third model. Uh, the text uh, refers to the reader and the reader, uh, the text's impact on the reader is reflected in the society. Um, the reader might have a variety of things to do, but he or she is still in the receiving end of the novel in both these models. Uh, in 
both the second and third models, there is some scope for looking at ways in which a particular reader society shapes his or her expectations and reading competences. The fundamental difference between the second and third model is that in the third, the reader is seen as having an active role to play in the reading and interpreting of the text. Then the fourth model, as I said, uh, it is uh, the new critical model of reading text where the text is self-contained and the author and the reader becomes rather unimportant. Then uh, coming to the last, uh, the fifth, that is the fourth model of uh, Booth, author, text and reader. And here Booth uh, argues that uh, such theories arose in part as a reaction. The reading theories arose as part of a reaction against the heavy and uncritical emphasis of new critics on the autonomous text. Is critical of the fourth model projected by the new critics. And if they and in the fifth model. Uh, the reader is given importance, maybe uh, because of uh, in the 1970s, uh, reader response criticism uh, was invoked, especially the, the texts of Stanley Fish and Wolfgang Eisen uh, must have influenced the input. So if you look at these five models, um, the movement from model one to model five, um, Roughly, we can say this moment in uh, the reading process, the, four, the five models of reading process, the first one starts from uh, 1780, uh, that is the end of the 18th century, uh, to 1980, that is the reader response kind of important, uh, reader response um, uh, theories influence is seen in the last and the fifth model. So, uh, it began with the first model where the focus of the author and his life and times uh, through an addiction to textual autonomy that comes with, um, to a height in the fourth model and an emphasis on the reader and the writer of the text in the final uh, section. Now, uh, I would also like to uh, speak, if time allows, a bit about, uh, a bit more about um, his work, The Company We Keep and Ethics of Fiction. I have already said that uh, this text actually develops uh, the major ideas of uh, Booth, uh, which he presented in the rhetoric of fiction. And Booth begins The Company We Keep with a narrative. The story of a black professor in his department named Paul Moses, who refused to teach the novel uh, Huckleberry Finn because of his perception of the harm it caused to him and, this, and his students. At first, Booth and his colleagues were shocked why Paul Moses um, is reluctant to teach one of the classics of American fiction. And they felt that uh, Moses was violating academic norms of objectivity. But Moses obviously could not read uh, properly, not to think, uh, uh, not think properly about the questions, um, about what questions might be relevant in judging a novel. That is how they thought at first. But later, their perception of their colleagues reluctance to teach these American classics changed. This classic uh, Huckleberry Finch changed. And Booth st uh, states, uh, in effect, he says that he and his colleagues were wrong in uh, their reasoning and their responses to Moses, Paul Moses. Why? Because Booth describes the stance taken by uh, Moses as an overt ethical appraisal and uh, now sees it as a legitimate form of literary criticism. So that is uh, how 
a bit of uh, political ideology is getting accepted towards the end of the Bose uh, career. Uh, Booth uh, argues that we cannot ignore the type of criticism Moses voiced when he claimed uh, that Huckleberry Finn was harmful to him and his students. And Booth encourages the very sort of examination and criticism that Moses made. Uh, by the time he writes the company of uh, the company uh, we live with. Uh, Booth had come to believe that even the most neutral and unbiased critic has an ethical program in his in mind. I quote from uh, the company, uh, this is what he says, the most neutral and unbiased critic has an ethical program in mind, a belief that is given way to, uh, a, a belief that a given way of reading uh, is what will do us most good. Booth calls this estimation or appraisal of the worth of the text ethical criticism and spends the bulk of the most part of the company we keep uh, exploring how this might be done. Uh, and in this connection, he uh, presents another term uh, that is codexion. Uh, that is a concept that he presents in this work. Instead of asking uh, whether this narrative will turn us towards virtue or vice tomorrow, we ask what kind of company it offers us to be. And that is how the title comes. And uh, what are uh, the relations we build with authors as we read? And uh, his uh, concern with ethics uh, is heightened in this work. Because he notes that Aristotle dedicated the third of uh, a third of Neomachian ethics to topics concerning friendship, and he uh, in the company we keep says that reading is a kind of friendship uh, because you are not getting distance from the uh, text and you are not getting um, isolated. You are not getting knowledge about an isolated self through. Um, reading, but reading becomes a social act, a, a kind of friendship with which, uh, through which we, we reach a different kinds of, um, we, uh, we reach different kinds of attitudes, uh, which may, maybe may have, which we may have considered not acceptable in the past, but uh, which are, which are acceptable as we grow and develop as a uh, better persons. And here he also refers to otherness. But this is not the otherness we speak of. Uh, fundamentally, Booth is interested in how we are shaped through our relationship with the implied author. Narratives ask us to accept and pursue a pattern of desire imposed, on, imposed by the other. The other here refers to uh, the, the implied author. And thus we have we enter into a conversation with the other, that is reading is a kind of conversation with the other, an act of friendship. And we decide whether or not we assent to the desires and fulfillments being offered to us through a text. Uh, this is what he says in the company we keep. In a sense, narratives propose a way of living. They ask us to consider whether what the narrative asks us to desire and fear and deplore and expect as we experience the lives of the characters within the characters within, providing a good kind of life for us as we recreate it for ourselves. So I think uh, uh, that is enough and we may have a discussion on
we may have a discussion on what we have already this is already 10:45 i think i am already on the limits thank you sir and now if the participants want to ask any questions they can ask them now when we see the rhetoric of fiction actually it was uh, you have two version right uh, the last one appearing in yes. 1983 okay before that 1983 yeah 1983 before that we had you know uh, two important theorist who talked on authorship and you know others intention uh, then what is an, actually the two writers who are in my mind are um, Roland Barth and Michel Foucault who yeah. uh, talked about the author and do you think what? that there is any connection with Foucault's what is an author with Wayne C Booth's the rhetoric when he talks about the reliable and uh, you know uh, the reliable and unreliable books unreliable narrator i have mentioned this is quite different from uh, the postmodern unreliable narrator uh, because in postmodern fiction we can see uh, narrators who whom we we cannot take uh, uh, for granted because uh, i am i'm just uh, I, i remember um, thomas pynchon's narrator in the gravity's rain book so uh, one sentence is like this he says uh, of course it happened and the next sentence is of course it did not so this kind of an unreliability is not there in uh, what both terms as uh, unreliable narrators uh, he calls uh, huck uh, huckleberry finn an as un unreliable because uh, huck actually says that uh, he is not at all a morally a good person but the narration or the narrative shows that he is really a morally good person that conflict between the the the, the character and uh, who narrates as well as the narrative that is what uh, booth uh, refers to underlay and i don't think booth uh, uh, could uh, in any way reflect uh, the the depths of uh, uh, the Uh, the author's author or the concept of the author which uh, foucault or barth uh, presented so exactly you know uh, the new aristotelianism or the chicago school uh, yeah he was much influenced by uh, the new aristotelians the chicago school and that is how he is and he was more concerned with the morals yes <laughs> one of the things about him is that he he stayed on in the academic field while uh, theory has been revolutionizing the field of academics uh, from 1960s onwards but he continued uh, one of the masters of uh, uh, the american academic world with his own theories as i said his last book was uh, written in 2004 yes is yes, actually uh... once you know there is a parallel movement once there is uh, the onslaught of theory into everything a theory of everything that we do and on the other side there is new aestheticism new aesthetic movement uh, you know then uh, uh, the classicism which is again restored so like that you know there is a parallel movement actually uh, people like wayne c booth represents that yeah he may be representing that but uh, ethics is I, i am not very sure about this but i think many of the postmodern uh, theorists speak of ethics but maybe in another uh, light uh, i am not very sure uh, i have read somewhere that even uh, judith butler speaks about uh, ethics I'm not very sure about this uh, there are, but uh, the ethics uh, both speaks of uh, as which which 
which is molded by his own upbringing as a Mormon. We know that Mormons are uh, very conservative uh, kind of Christians. Uh, remember the uh, the Sherlock Holmes uh, novel, mm -hmm. where the the first okay. novel, uh, the Mormon uh, appears. So the ethics, uh, when we consider ethics, uh, ethics can be uh, very personal. Ethics can be uh, confined to a particular uh, society or a social group. Uh, one one thing about uh, uh, Booth is he uh, Booth, which I find uh, admirable, is he does not turn a, a blind eye entirely to uh, the politics, uh, the, polit the what you call broadly politics, broadly politics. Uh, he may not be giving uh, much importance to politics, but he is much concerned with society, uh, how the society affects reading, uh, how the uh, text influences the society and such things. Uh, that is, that may be because he was trained by the uh, New Aristotelian school, the Chicago school. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Jivan Kumar, for your wonderful talk on Wayne C. Booth. It was interesting to hear that Booth's upbringing, upbringing helped him to assert on morality and how he subordinated the technical aspects and highlighted the moral position of the novel. We could also understand about the implied or the dramatized and undramatized narrative, five more of reading process, and about his concern with ethics. So thank you so much for finding the time to making uh, to make this wonderful talk. Thank you, sir. Welcome and thank you for your patient listening. Thank you. So our second talk is on Betty Frieden by Dr. Engida, um, a professor and Mother Mother Teresa Women's University Kodekanal. So before I invite Dr. Engida, I ask Anita Siji to make a talk on Dr. N. Gita. Uh, uh, we will have a short break. Actually, this talk will start on uh, 11.30. So we will rejoin at uh, 11.20. Okay, we shall rejoin at 11.20. Okay.